everyone, I'm Nikki Jovikik from Lookup Strata and for today's Queensland webinar, I'm delighted to welcome a colleague of mine, Will Markin from Tower Body Corporate. For disclosure and for those who are not aware, while most of my time is spent running Lookup Strata, I'm also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate. Okay, with that out of the way, in this Queensland webinar, we're taking a deep dive into body corporate finances. What do you know about your building's budget? Lot owners may not always have an understanding of the budget, and today's session with Will is going to change that. Will has practical examples to run us through line by line. We'll be talking about what your body corporate fees are made up of and whether these expenses are necessary. There may also be a few tips on how to control rising costs. After Will's presentation, and actually during the presentation as well, uh, we cover quite a few Q&As. Before we begin, I'd like to mention, as always, that the information contained in this session today, including discussions that arise from any submitted questions and also uh, discussions that are happening during the chat, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. We thank Will for joining us today. The last time Will was here for a Look Up Strata webinar, he was actually the facilitator and he filled in for me while I was overseas. So I thank Will for doing that. But today he's in the hot seat. So Will Markin joined the Tower team as a general manager and as general manager and senior strata manager in 2020, a licensed strata manager. He has widespread experience across all forms of commercial, industrial, residential schemes and a former journalist and teacher, Will believes in proactive ethical strata management and hopes to provide Towers customers with the knowledge and support required to take their schemes forward into the next generation of body corporate management. Will is a regular contributor to Look Up Strata as both a writer and podcast figure. He's appeared on quite a few of our webinars. You've probably seen him before and his practical responses to those tricky Queensland strata questions appear regularly in both our newsletters and magazines as well. Uh, so yeah, Will, I'll jump to you and um, you can start having a chat about the, the session today. Thanks for joining us. All right, thanks, Nikki. It's good to be back in the uh, hot seat <laughs> once again after swapping places with you. Uh, hello to everyone out there. Thanks very much for joining the session today. Uh, as Nikki was mentioning, we were hoping it might be a little bit more uh, interactive than some, some of these sessions usually are. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, a body corporate budget. I'm prepared a dummy one for everyone to take a look at. And if you're having questions uh, as, as, I'm, as, I, as I'm raising each line item or discussing each uh, item of expenditure, please fire through your question and I'll do my best to answer them uh, on the spot. Think of it, if you like, as a, as a committee meeting or an AGM or something like that, where the manager might be presenting a budget to you as a group of owners. And then in those situations, it's natural that people have questions. So please uh, feel free to fire away. Uh, what I did want to say on budgets is that there is no absolute method of doing a budget. There is not necessarily a correct way or, or there are some incorrect ways that you can do it. But different managers that you meet in different companies, they'll have different approaches. And that's OK. Right. So if you have a, someone who says, oh, but my manager likes to do it this way, that's fine. There's nothing wrong. With what we're not we're not trying to present you today with any kind of absolutist theory of how budgeting must be done. But it's about trying to consider what is good practice when there is budgets and then trying to think if, if your scheme is uh, experiencing good practice at that time. All right, so what I'm going to do is just share my screen with you. And Nikki, hopefully you can confirm that everybody can see that one. Uh, it is coming up. Yeah, it is. It's right there now. So thanks, Will. We can see that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this is a scheme. Uh, this is a dummy budget for a scheme. Uh, I'm an optimist, so I've named it Paradise Towers. Uh, if anyone lives in Paradise Towers, then please let us know. Uh, congratulations to you. Life's not always that easy in body corporates, but uh, we, we, hope, we hope for the best. Uh, so what I can see when, I, when I've got my uh, budget here is I've got Paradise Towers. I can see it's got a little notation underneath here, which is BFP, which means it's a building format plan. Uh, so uh, the, opposition, the opposite side of that would be a standard format plan. Building format plans tend to have higher expenditure than standard format plans, where more expenditure is borne by the lot owners. Uh, I've also got a notation here, one, two, three, four, five, six, which is just our CTS number for the scheme. And we can see that these are the financial statements for the period from 1st of uh, October 2021 to 30th of September 2022. So the year, financial year has just finished. 
Okay, and we all know that when the financial year finishes, that tends to be the trigger point for a body corporate manager to create a new budget for the next year, which will then be presented at the AGM. So this is a fairly standard kind of document that we would create uh, in that situation. Moving on down, uh, I've got, and you can see that I have here the uh, administrative fund. Uh, lower down the page, I've got the sinking fund. We'll come to that later on. Uh, I've got codes on the left. Probably didn't need to include, include include codes for a dummy presentation, but you're likely to see them on your uh, your budgets uh, in in real life. And the codes are really just internal codes allocating funds to each different area. Then we have a description, so fairly fairly obvious. What is the expense uh, being considered? And then uh, we have actual, which is how much money was actually spent on a line item between 1st of October 21 and 30th of uh, September 22. We have the budget for that period. So the budget for the period 1st of October 21 to September 22. So when we, when we look uh, in comparison between actual and the budget, we're seeing what the budget was versus what was actually spent. And then on the right hand side, we have a column which is next year's budget which is our anticipated budget or the budget we would present to owners uh, for next year's costs. All fairly straightforward, I hope. And hopefully this is something that you're, you should be seeing a document, you know, maybe not exactly like this, but hopefully similar to this in, in your budgets uh, every year for all of the committee members there. Okay, so what I can see is that I've got administrative fund income. And in uh, for the last financial year, we budgeted uh, for an income of 130,000. And in fact, $130,000 was raised in total, which is great. But this scheme has a discount of 13,000 uh, of 10%, uh, which is a pay on time uh, discount. A pay on time discount is good. Are they beneficial for your scheme? Well, I wonder what you think. Personally, as a body corporate manager, I'm not really in favor. Why is that? Because while I've raised one hundred and while I've raised one hundred and thirty thousand here uh, from the discount, I only get uh, the scheme only actually has an income of one hundred and seventeen thousand uh, dollars. I think it is artificial to give yourselves a discount. Um, the contractors don't give you a discount. Your electric company doesn't give you a discount. So all that really happens when we have a discount in place is that you raise less money, and in fact we have to then sort of artificially raise the amount of money that's being raised to balance, balance that out. Nonetheless, some people think the discount's very beneficial. Um, they think that it's a good incentive for owners to pay on time. I, well, maybe that's true. My view is that there's a, also an incentive for them to pay on time in the form of uh, late levy payments and being referred to a debt collector. And my experience has been that I haven't really seen any particular difference between schemes that don't have a discount and do have a discount in terms of whether arrears are, are up to date or not. Nonetheless, something for you to think about. Um, and this, this particular scheme does have a discount applied. So the budget was for, we were, it was $130,000, and in fact, $117,000 total income came into the scheme. So we're fairly, fairly comfortable with having that amount of money coming in. Okay, then what we can see as we scroll down on the left hand side here, uh, these are all the expense items. And then uh, this is, of course, as I was just saying, uh, the uh, actual expenditure and the budget, and then I'll come to what I'll come to next year's uh, ex next year's budget a little bit, a little bit later. Okay, expense items are often listed in alphabetical order, uh, not necessarily, not, not necessarily, but they're always working. It's, it's typical, that's typical where they come in. Uh, we can see here we've got audit fees. You know, when we budgeted fifteen hundred for audit fees, they came in at fourteen hundred and fifty dollars. So we're pretty comfortable with that. It means we knew we probably, as body corporate managers, we probably knew the price in advance, and price came out about correct. So pretty happy. Bank charges. Sometimes you see these on body corporate statements. Sometimes you don't. They're usually pretty minimal, just for maybe moving money around or something the banks charge you for, you know, some kind of minor use of their accounts or something like that. Usually nothing very much to uh, consider. Okay. Next item, we're going to come to come to quite a big item of discussion, which is body corporate administration. So this is uh, typically the fee that you pay for your to your body corporate manager for uh, the agreed services under their contract. 
And a lot of people are going to have questions about uh, body corporate fees and how they work out and whether they're fair or correct. And I'm just going to take a sort of dive into that. And what I want to say, first of all, is that when you're having a look at what the costs of the body corporate manager are, they should mostly be in the administrative fund, but they're probably going to be split up across a number of line items. So it's not going to be just the top line item that you should look at, but there, there'll be a number. So in this case, I've got body corporate administration here. And then that's followed by body corporate non-contract. Uh, so they're the main two body corporate fees. But have I got any others? Well, down at the bottom here, I've got software licensing fee. This is a fee that you might pay uh, to your body corporate managers for uh, license licensing software. It's only three hundred dollars in this case, but uh, it's still a, it's still a fee that you could apply against if you're adding up the total of what a body corporate manager's fees are. You might consider it within that. This particular budget, I haven't listed any other fees, but you might want to bear that in mind when you're looking at it. Look at how many line items belong to the body corporate manager and add up the total. Don't just look at the headline item of administration and non-contract fees, because that might not give you the full impression of how much you've actually been charged by your body corporate manager over the past uh, 12 months. Okay, for this particular scheme, body corporate administration, well, we knew what the fees were going to be in advance, 7,500. So we budgeted for that and that's worked out exactly. So that, that's all fine. What you might not know, what we didn't know in advance is what the non-contract fees were. We budgeted 4,000 and they came out at $5,000. Well, it's not unusual that you might get a higher item on the budget, but we might consider why that is. Uh, does everyone know how a body corporate contract works. It's a question that I'm often trying to explain to people while I'm uh, going out and sort of selling tower. What you need to know is that most body corporate contracts operate in two parts. Uh, that is a, a section for agreed services and a section for, well, professional services that can be described in slightly different ways. But your agreed services are generally covered under what's what would be considered the administration contract here. What are your agreed services? Well, each contract's different, so you should probably check the one for your, uh, with your body corporate manager. But typically, they cover things like running the AGM, issuing your levy notices, holding your financial records, arranging your bank account, a whole range of secretarial and financial services that are designed to keep your scheme legal through the year, essentially. What are the non-contract services? Well, it's everything that's not an agreed service. Um, so it could be it could be all of the all of the work involved. Uh, the obvious ones are maintenance and issuing issuing bylaw notices, but it could be anything really that the body corporate asks the body corporate manager to do uh, in terms of the on their on their behalf. Uh, what I would say is that it's very important to all owners out there that you take the time to try to read and understand your body corporate contract. A lot of people have complaints. They say my managers charge too much. Uh, we seem to have lots of costs that don't seem very relevant. Well, all of the fees that the body corporate manager is charging should be clearly listed within the contract. Read it. If you don't understand it, ask your body corporate manager. Ask them to explain uh, what are the fees? Why are you being charged for them? If the body corporate manager can come back and provide you know, a pretty clear and reasonable answer, I think that's a good sign. There's nothing wrong with body corporate managers uh, charging for example that's that's not a bad thing in and of itself because all of the body corporate companies are you know for-profit companies operating in a capitalist market they're allowed to make a profit however if the body corporate manager is kind of struggling to define what a cost is for you or if they can't be reasonably justify what it is well you might have reasonable cause for concerns within that uh, i might also say that you might want to look out for uh, certain fees that are applied by some companies that are probably not really that necessary to apply and are, are really just a bit of fat on the top for, for some companies. Um, I don't really want to identify these too much. You might think about a welcome letter. Some companies charge for a welcome letter to be issued when a new owner moves into a property and perhaps they charge $50 for this. But what have, what's the body corporate company really done for that? They've sent out a letter to say, hello, uh, I don't particularly agree with these type of fees myself, but they are legal and they are part of the contract. What I'm saying is it's up to you as owners to understand that contract 
and then consider whether you're happy with those fees or not. And if you're not happy, well, then you should start having a conversation with the body corporate manager about it. Perhaps they will remove those fees for you. Or if they don't want to, then you might you know, consider whether there are other managers out there who are offering a more equitable service. I don't, so that's what I, yeah. Um, the key part of it is know your contract and understand it as a group of owners, because what you can be sure about is that your body corporate manager knows the contract and knows how to make money out of it. Okay, so we've got the administration fees and then body corporate non-contract. Well, non-contract fees could be anything throughout the year, but they are a reflection of the amount of time that the body corporate manager would have spent on your building throughout the last 12 months. Um, people often ask me, why are the fees, why are the fees high? Why did we pay for this? And then I will say, go back to them and say, well, it took an extraordinary amount of time to manage your scheme across the last 12 months, and we had to apply the fees for, for, for the time taken. What I want you to bear in mind out there as owners is that the non-contract fees don't have to be applied. Uh, I have a couple of schemes that we manage where they're, they're a fairly large scheme, 60 to 100 lots, where almost no non-contract fees uh, are applied. Why is that? Well, it's because the owners tend to be doing most of the work themselves. They're very organized committees who get together, talk to talk with each other, and they're happy to undertake uh, research projects, deal with contractors, and uh, generally organize and run the building themselves. They don't need my assistance very much. We just provide financial and administrative assistance. And as a result, all of their fees uh, are covered by the agreed services and they hardly get any non-contract fees. That's good for them, but they're owners who are prepared to put the time in. On the other hand, I've got some buildings where the owners might call us you know, every day or twice a day or three times a day or something like this and those buildings tend to take up quite a lot of time and they need a lot of energy to be put into them and when you have a situation like that uh, we have quite high uh, non-contract fees as a result. Um, I often tell people that if they want to keep their non-contract fees down you know either do the work yourself but if you don't have time except that the body corporate manager is going to do it but the, one of the key, key things that keeps pushing fees up is when you have owners who are in dispute or you have individual body corporate members who simply don't accept the, the body corporate rules or consistently break the bylaws or who write to the manager on a persistent basis. Um, if you have committees that aren't in agreement with each other, that tends to cause a lot of problems and pushes up your non-contract non uh, fees as well. So you need to think about where you are as a scheme because your, your non-contract fees are a reflection of the amount of time it takes to manage your scheme. Does that make sense, Nikki? Hope so. It does. And can I just ask, Will, um, I'm just jumping. Josephine's just asked a question and says your actual column figures are all rounded. So I guess that this is an example. And do you think there should be a breakdown of large items such as um, repair and maintenance building $8,000? Is now a good time yeah, to talk about um, that? They, yeah, they, they are all rounded. So I should emphasize that this is just an example budget. It's not, it's not necessarily a reflection of real life costs. And just because I've got these fees listed here, it doesn't mean that that's the same fee should be reflection in your building. Uh, this is just a, a dummy building that I created in my head. Uh, I kept the fees round because I thought that would be easier for everyone to have a look at. Um, should the fees be broken up into finer and finer lines? Uh, you know, I know that some budgets do, do 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 that, and other ones tend to be a bit more generalised. I think either way is okay. But if you yourself want to see a more granular uh, breakdown of what all the fees are, then that's okay. Uh, as body corporate managers usually have the software tools to create uh, those lists for you, or go back and show you all of the invoices. Um, I think you should just ask for that. And it can be it can be presented to you, uh, but I can understand that uh, the budget general budget presentation might be a little bit more broad than some some people like because it goes to like quite a broad audience. So you have to create some kind of balance as a body corporate manager between listing absolutely everything and giving people kind of like a, a snapshot of what's going on. Uh, I think it's fine if you want to see everything. All of that information should be transparent and available to you, but it's available in a different type of report. And you should just you should just ask for that report if that's the information that you want. And that's like any financials really, isn't it, Will? Um, whether it's a, a company's finances or uh, a body corporate's finances, the same, same applies. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and what I all, I've, I've sort of said it already, but you should never feel afraid of asking a question. And the body corporate manager should always be happy to provide you with the answer to that question. And provided they're giving you the answer, that's usually okay. And it's and if they're not really able to answer that question for you in more granular detail, then that's probably yeah, that's probably a red a red flag you might want to you might want to consider, right? So if I just say if someone says, "What's the breakup of that ten thousand dollars?" and I go, "Oh yeah, some <laughs> expenses, yeah, just money you've spent over the year," that's probably not a very good example, right? But it's probably it's probably not a very good manager. But I should what I should be able to say to you is, okay, I can provide you with that breakdown exactly of what every single figure is. Uh, in an ideal circumstance, I might be able to provide you with that information on the spot, but at the very least, I should be able to come back to you within 24 hours or so to provide that kind of detail. And I guess that kind of leads on to Lynn's question. She's just asked that they have a sundry code, which usually has about $400 to $500 in it, and there's no explanation given um, on what goes under that heading. So uh, same applies, just ask the question and see what, um, what the strata manager says. Yeah, I think so. Um, Suntrees is quite an interesting uh, category to have uh, because in Queensland budgets, we're not supposed to budget for contingencies. Uh, this is another part of budgeting under the legislation that I'm not a particular fan of. Why can't you budget for a contingency? Uh, I do in my house. In my, when I do my household budget, we do together, Nikki, when we do the budget for a tower and things like this. I suspect e almost every uh, business and every household in Australia has some kind of number for contingencies in their head when they uh, calculate out their budgets. For some reason, it's never really been explained to me why body corporate budgets are not supposed to include uh, contingencies, or at least in Queensland, they're not. Um, you know, I Sundry sounds like a contingency to me. <laughs> that might that might that might be a that might be a small that might be a small problem uh, in in that case. What's the advice in terms of how to ha how to handle contingencies? Well, the main advice is to sort of do a workaround and uh, inflate costs uh, in certain items of the budget so that you would have extra money uh, than you than you might actually need. So, for example, if I look at my budget for plumbing, uh, four thousand. OK, I might really believe it's going to be, you know, 3,800 or something like that, which is fine. But if I wanted to add my false contingency, I might make the budget for that $5,000 so that I know there would be an extra thousand in there to give me a bit of flexibility if, if I needed it. Do I think that's particularly good practice? Personally, not really. I would rather just have a line item. For, I would just rather have a line item for contingencies because then I can explain it to my customers honestly about what it is rather than trying to say, oh, yeah, the legislation says this. But so we're trying to get a workaround to make sure that your your budget for the year is reasonable. Yeah, OK, that's not, a you know, as a as a manager, I'm supposed to sort of I can't really advise you to break the legislation or, or breach the legislation. I'm not, not. I'm not going to do that here. But I think that this is an area of the legislation that really should be changed uh, sooner rather than later. Because um, you know, why aren't we trusting committees and owners to have a line item for contingencies? It's, it's a fairly simple question, and I don't think there's a credible answer as to why that might not be the case. And if there's anything that the last 12 months has taught us is that you need contingencies because things happen that we're not not exactly. planning to happen. So, um, yeah. And Eliza's just asked, uh, and this came in on a host of panellists, so you won't see it in everyone chat, but it was just asked by someone in the session. Um, Hi, Will, what do you mean by not supposed to? Is this a legal requirement? And I think she's referring to the contingencies in that in that question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not supposed to have a line item that says contingencies. If you do have one, what happens? Well, uh, nothing very much, I suppose. You, you know, you, people in your um, people in the body corporate could might challenge that, might take the budget, you know, to the commissioner's office or something like that if that happens. But you know, like I say, to my, to my in my mind, it's it's a, a, a section of the legislation that should be changed sooner rather than later. But if you're asking me for the the legal position, it's that that's what it's you're not supposed to have one. Um, okay, so uh, we were having a look at, you know, body, body corporate contracts. And uh, as I was saying, I think the main thing is you as owners understand, make sure you understand what your contract is. And if you have questions, ask your manager to explain what all of the costs are. So that's their job. 
they have to explain for their company. Okay, so as we're looking down the uh, the budget here, I've got cleaning. Now, this particular this particular firm doesn't really, or this particular scheme, I've budgeted zero for cleaning. Why is that? Well, because this scheme has a manager and caretaker in place, uh, and they, in the idea is that the cleaning at the scheme is handled by the manager and caretaker under their under their fees. Uh, if you don't have a manager or caretaker in place you'll probably have a line item on your budget for cleaning and gardening and things like that because they'll be handled by separate contractors that the body corporate wouldn't be engaging on an individual basis uh, like all contractor costs cleaning costs are going up gardening costs are going up uh, it can be difficult to control them at times what i would say to body corporates is check your con check your contracts with with uh, your contractors quite regularly and see where they are. If you've signed like a three year contract with a cleaner or a gardener, that contract is going to have an escalation fee in every year. It might be CPI, or it might be, uh, it might just be a fixed percentage, say 3% or something like that. Um, if you feel that the costs are getting too high, even if you're in a mid contract period, it's still okay to go back to that contractor and perhaps ask them to renegotiate or perhaps see if you can create a new deal. Will the contractor accept it? Maybe, maybe not. But what the contractor wants is a long-term relationship with you. That's how they make money. So even if you do have a kind of fixed contract in place, they should also be mindful of that long-term relationship and they might want to reach a new agreement with you if you think that your costs are spiraling out of control or if you just think that too many, you've got too many costs in general and you want to cut back your budget to some extent. So uh, cleaning costs, gardening costs, uh, you know, contracts with fire, fire contractors, any kind of regular maintenance contractor that you have, uh, keep an eye on those contracts and bear in mind that you can negotiate them if you, if you need to. Can I just jump in there, Will? We just had a question that came through from Ross and he's saying, does it really matter what you detail in your budget um, line by line with the dollar value allocated if you can still go ahead and spend how much you wish on whatever you wish during the year, as long as you comply with the spending limit rules, et cetera, and have enough money in the fund to cover the costs when the invoice is received? Well, I think it matters to most people who own in body corporate uh, who own in body corporates and who want to see that the budget's being carefully thought through. I mean, that's kind of like a, a philosophical point that you could argue if you want to, but then are you saying the whole whole point of budgeting is worthwhile and that all you do is just list a money a line item for how much money you're bringing in and that's all the, the all the information you're going to provide to owners. Ross, are you happy with that as an owner? If that's what we present to you, uh, my guess is probably not. So uh, I, I think that the line items get presented on that basis because the purpose is to show owners how the money is being spent, be transparent about that, and then give them confidence that their body corporate is being run in the correct fashion. Uh, yeah, you're right that expenditure can go outside of the budget it's not a fixed it's not a fixed number it's not a fixed cost that we're putting in place here uh, so there is flexibility within it okay all right so uh we have a we, in this particular scheme uh there's no particular budget for cleaning but i've put it in there for the specific reasons that uh i've just listed okay we've got uh, electricity costs coming up all right, uh, this one, electricity costs of this scheme, fairly, fairly static. We know, you know, we've managed it for a number of years. We know how much they, we know approximately how much they are. The last year's budget was 3,800. Does it matter that it went to 3,900? Not particularly, you know, we were kind of on target and it, no one's got a crystal ball when we set out uh, what the budget is in place, we've kind of got in the right area. Uh, electricity, people need to be aware that you know, electric costs are going up over the next uh, year, you know, over the next two years. We've heard the Treasurer forecasting that. So when you're doing your budget for your next year, you might want to bear that in mind. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really know how much they're going to go up. Uh, we don't have an exact uh, idea of that. So you, you have to think about whether they're going to go up 10% or 15% or 20%. But for anyone looking forward or anyone who's creating their budget over the next uh, three or four months or something like that, that's a key thing to bear in mind that they, they are going to go up. 
Well, can I jump in there too and just ask, I mean, we're hearing from so many different um, sources about inflation and how much it's impacting, affecting um, budgets in buildings. So if a budget hasn't been, if uh, it hasn't been done in the last six months, if it was done sort of six months out, are you um, recommending that committees go back and reforecast their budget at this point or waiting it out till the end of the year or what's, what's your advice along those lines? I would, unless, I would recommend keeping a tight eye on your budget and your cash at hand, I think. I mean, obviously some buildings operate with very limited cash at hand. And if they are, they might find themselves in trouble as inflation goes up, as cost goes up, uh, they could find themselves getting to a point where they have almost you know, zero in the bank and then that, that could cause a significant issue for them. Schemes that have, you know, money in the bank, you might just have to accept that that your savings are going to decrease a little bit, but a little, a little, a little faster than you than you had had planned. I don't think it's really worth overturning the budget or going back and holding new meetings, you know, reissuing levies because well, there's cost to that. There's also a great deal of confusion if you go ahead and do that. Um, I, I don't think that would be particularly beneficial for the majority of schemes out there, um, but certainly uh, all of the treasurers out there and all of the committee members, you know, make sure you're looking at your uh, expenditure. It doesn't have to be every week necessarily, but every couple of months or so, see where you're tracking. Are costs going? Is, is, is your budget blowing out? Um, if so, then you might have to think about, uh, you know, taking some corrective action in that instance. Um, otherwise, you know, call your body corporate manager and have a chat with them about it. See if there's any areas where you might be able to make a saving, or it might just be the case that you have to pull back a little bit in the last three, three or six months of the financial year just to try to make sure that you meet some, meet some of those targets uh, available to you. you don't, yeah, but you have to be, be conscious of it. Um, most body corporates these days, you can access all of your financial records online. Uh, so like at Tower, we work with Stratamax and then owners can go, go through to the Stratamax portal and they should be able to put off their, finan their financial statements 24-7. You know, um, if you don't have a system that does that, there shouldn't really be any problem for your body corporate manager to provide you with a, a record of the financial statements if you write to them and ask for it. You know, it's, it's a relatively easy document for us to produce and we, you know, it takes just a minute for us to send an email back. So if you have concerns, the first thing to do is take take the time to look at look at the statements and just monitor them, just as you would do your you know your home bank statement or something like that every month, three months if that's what's required, and, and make sure that you're on track. And if you're not on track, ask a couple of questions and see what you can do. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then we just had a question from another um, person in the session, just saying, how do you get the figures for the budget? Like, how do you know what figures to put in there? We have had that question in other states before when people are pulling together budgets, and they just don't know what what figures to put in um, for maintenance of things like lifts over the years. Is it based on what had been charged previously? Is that the best way to work it out? If you're if you're the treasurer for a new uh, term, and you haven't had this experience before? Yeah, um, it's a little bit of science and it's a little bit of art. <laughs> you, have to, you have to kind of meld the two and try to use try to use your knowledge. Uh, okay, past past budgets are obviously provide some indication of what the future budget might do, but they're not the final indication. Uh, you might have spent five thousand dollars on plumbing last year because there was a leak, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a leak this year or the year after that or anything like that. So it's it, it can be pretty hard, especially with maintenance issues, because some items that we will know that the body corporate is preparing to undertake. So you, you'll have been in a discussion with your body corporate manager over a period of time about whether, okay, in three months time, we're gonna do the landscaping of the gardens and we've already approved a quote. And that quote's $10,000, so the body corporate manager might know that, and then it's fairly easy to put that quote into the budget. But realistically, we don't have a crystal ball knowing if you're going to have an electric failure or if there's going to be a leak or something along those lines. You kind of have to just, you know, look at the past history, think about what might happen, consider you know, what's what's safe and what's not safe. And, and, and you have to try to come up with a figure that you feel comfortable with. And the reality is sometimes that figure's accurate. 
and sometimes it's not. <laughs> and that's kind of what I was coming back to about having contingencies and having money in the bank and things like this. You need to be prepared for, you know, the times when that figure is not accurate. And sometimes the figure is not accurate in a positive way, right? Sometimes we might budget, you know, we might budget $5,000 for electrical repairs or something over the next 12 months. But hey, the system works. Your electrics are fine. And maybe we only spend $1,000 and you, you've got $4,000 uh in in credit if you like but what tends to happen is that that four thousand dollars then gets spent in another area where you know we hadn't quite you know we hadn't quite anticipated all, all of the costs um i would say don't beat yourself up about it if you're a treasurer out there you you know your your requirement is to kind of make reasonable decisions and you just have to make the best decisions you can based on the information that you have available at the time you can't, you're not expected necessarily to project into the future because you just can't absolutely project into the future. It's not, it's not possible. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Will. Okay. Um, next line item on the agenda, I'm a bit conscious of time, is yes. insurance. But this is obviously uh, a critical line item for lots of owners out there. Why? Because it tends to be the largest or second largest line item of expenditure uh, that you undertake through a year. And well, insurance is going up a lot fast at the moment. Uh, typically, we're seeing insurance costs increase 10 to 25 percent for most schemes at the moment. Uh, the 10 percent is probably a bit, of, a bit of an optimistic number. Uh, more, more, more often, I would say it's getting up to that 20 percent, twenty five percent, and that's at schemes that have been not making claims, that have just been, uh, you know, perfectly normal, no, no, no big changes, no big drama. Bad luck, the market's going up. You're got, you should be expecting to pay more for your insurance. I wish I could give you a better answer. There isn't, there probably really isn't one out there. Um, you know, if you watch the news, you know some of the reasons why insurance costs are going up. Queensland, we had in February this year, you know, major, major flooding. Uh, insurers will be paying out billions of dollars from that. Uh, insurance companies aren't, uh, they, they exist to make money for their shareholders. They are going to be clawing some of that money back from uh, all of the people in the country who pay insurance. That's just kind of the reality of what it is. So you have to sort of start anticipating that. The uh, cost should go up, I'm afraid. Can you do anything about it? Well, it's pretty tough. Um, you have to try to make sure your scheme has as few claims as possible, uh, especially small and minor, uh, small and minor claims. Uh, it might be better for the body corporate to be paying those uh, costs itself rather than putting those rather than putting them through insurance. Um, so, if you have a insurance claim for say an item that was fifteen hundred dollars with an excess of five hundred, uh, the net back to the body corporate might be a thousand dollars today, which is great. But if that claim is then going to push up your next premium by two thousand dollars, you're not really making a profit because you know you're going to be you're you're paying more uh, at the next premium. Um, there's no absolute formula for that, but generally I would advise people to try to avoid making small claims if they can. And the size of a small claim might depend on the size of your building. So a small claim for a five lot scheme might be very different to a small claim for say a, a two a two hundred lot scheme. You have to sort of bear that in mind. Um, it's also very important to ensure that your building is undertaking all necessary repair and maintenance items. Uh, insurers are getting extremely risk averse and extremely concerned about any potential, you know, unre uh, unrepaired uh, items around a body corporate property. When that's happening, they tend to be putting up the premiums on that property quite a lot. So if you have a roof that's a little bit damaged and you're thinking, oh, maybe we can put this off until next year or something like that. Well, when the body corporate manager is making their declarations to the insurer, they have to say, well, they've got a roof that's not completely repaired and the insurer will calculate that into your next premium. Um, so the best thing that you can do is have the roof repaired and then the body corporate manager can say to the insurer, this is a good scheme. They've had their roof repaired. They fixed all their gutters. You know, we should be trying to, you should be trying to help them get a lower premium. And the insurer should be looking at your scheme to sort of say, yeah, that's a lower risk scheme for us. And so we can adjust, we can adjust accordingly. Not sure if there are any questions coming through there. I'm just going to 
Uh, I've I've written a few down that I might um, ask you at the end of the session, Will, unless they're really pertinent, because I am too also worried about the time. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit quicker. Um, yeah, so anyway, be aware with insurance that costs are going up, so think about it quite a bit. Okay, next item on this on this uh, budget is the manager caretaker fees. Okay, so we, we have you have a contract with your manager or caretaker if you have one. So we know what the fees are. So we budgeted 54,000 and they paid 54,000. Uh, I think what's interesting here is that in next year's budget, I've budgeted 58,000. So that's a $4,000 increase. Why does, it, why does it go up? Well, your uh, agreement with your caretaker will have a, a clause in it that includes uh, either a fixed annual increase or an increase by CPI. So uh, this year, uh, where we've had buildings with a manager's contracts that go up by CPI, that's typically been around 7% uh, that we've seen those contractors, uh, those fees rise. And 7%, you know, can be quite a lot. When you start with a contract that's worth 50,000, it can go up to 53,000 and then 58,000 and then 60, 66,000 or something like this very, very quickly within a number of years. Um, this is I might just jump in there, Will, and just say that you wrote an article about that, which we've got on the site, and I'll send that link out to everybody um, this afternoon or this afternoon or tomorrow morning when we send the recording out as well so that they can have a read through that, because I think it was a really great article too. Yeah, and so in that article, what I was suggesting to people is that they calculate out what the total value of their, their contract with their uh, caretaker is going to be over a period of time. And you can, it, you, you can calculate that out by adding what, what the fixed percentages are, and you have to do a projection for CPI percentages and things like that. But doing that calculation gives you a much clearer idea of actually how much you're going to pay your caretaker over time and how that's going to affect your budget. Uh, and a lot of people say to me, well, they want their levies to go down. And I say, well, that's fine, but you have to bear in mind that your insurance is going to go up. And that is a legislative requirement that you have insurance. Your caretaker's fees are going to go up and that's a contractual agreement that you have with your caretaker. You're not going to be able to get out of that. So where is the area where you're expecting that your levies will, will, will decline? Now, there's obviously different parts of the budget we can discuss with, but the conversation often starts with, what's going up rather than what's going down, because whether you like it or not, you're going to have to pay your insurance. You're going to have to pay your, you, you know, you're going to have to pay for your, uh, your caretaker. You're, you're going to have to do the fire repairs and things like that. So you should always bear that in mind. Okay, I'll move through, I'll move through the rest of these a little bit quicker because these are all fairly standard line items. Um, we have things like pest control, repair and maintenance building. Uh, there was that question earlier, repair and maintenance building is probably a bit of a vague, uh, all, in, all in one kind of uh, line, line item there. So it might be worth investigating further if you want to know exactly what that is. Electrical, fire equipment, gardens and grounds, plumbing, pool maintenance. I think telephone, I think they're all fairly self-explanatory to most people in terms of what the costs, in terms of what the costs are. And then we have things like uh, taxation. Um, you have to do your BAS filings. And you have to do, you have to submit your tax uh, files every year. And that tends to cost around $1,000 or so for most schemes with a little bit of variation either side. And in this particular building, I included a fee for software licensing, just because it's something that I felt was worth, worth highlighting because on most body corporate uh, managing agreements, there is a separate line item fee now for software. And it's always something that you should be conscious of and maybe ask, you know, how much, how much is it? Why is it so much? Or what, where, where did the cost for that come from? So that gives me my admin budget on the as a, on the, uh, the two columns on the left and middle. So I've got the last year's uh, budget and then the actual expenditure. We can see on this one, well, actual expenditure was 122,000, where I had uh, raised 117,000. Okay, so we spent $5,400 more on the budget than we anticipated. Is that a big problem? Five thousand dollars out of a budget of one hundred and twenty or so thousand. For me, it's not such, it's not such a big issue. Ideally, you'd finish in the red, but provided there were savings in the bank um, to cover to cover that difference, I don't see that it's it's such a major problem to have like a a small budget deficit along along those lines. If you're having a budget deficit that's you know fifty percent 
uh, outside of your budget uh, anticipated budget that might be more of a problem and you might want to have a discussion with your body corporate manager about why that is doesn't necessarily mean that the budget was bad in the first place it's probably more likely that there were a lot of un unanticipated expenditures that you had to attend to over, over the past 12 months okay and Mike's just asking there quickly, uh, Will, what is the best practice in handling um, distributing an end of year actual surplus to budgets should it arise if you happen to, to get a, a surplus? In terms of distributing it, I mean, in theory, you could distribute it back to owners if that's what you really wanted to do. Uh, but most schemes tend to just hold on to it and use it as a use, use it as a sort of additional amount of money that they have in their accounts to cover you know, next year's budget. If next year's budget's uh, under underdone, then you know one one offset one offsets the other. So most people tend to just keep the money in the admin fund like that. Um, it's probably not such a good thing. You don't want, necessarily want your admin fund to be rising to sort of super normal levels or anything like that. Uh, what I would suggest to most, if I had a scheme where it had a very large amount of money in the admin fund, we might suggest sort of artificially raising less money for a 12 month period so that that would bring that money down. Um, owners would be happy because they would be paying less money for that 12 month period and eventually you'd get back to more of a, a stable a stable position. It is also possible to redistribute money to owners if that's what you want, but that would be quite an unusual situation, I would suggest in most, most occasions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then so because I've I've got last year's I've got last year's budget, last year's actual expenses, and on the basis of that, then I create a new budget, um, which in this case last year, you know, we looked at one hundred and thirty thousand here. This month, this time around, I'm looking at one hundred and fifty thousand. Most budgets are going up at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, we have to take in, into case, you know, all of the added expenditures, such as the caretaker's cost, the insurance that I was, I was mentioning before, we have to consider inflation. Um, you should bear in mind that body corporate managers are always a bit fearful, I think, presenting higher budgets to customers. As a body, you know, as a body corporate manager, I feel like I'm the, the owner of the budget in some way, but that's, that's, that's completely wrong. I'm not the owner of it. The owners, are the, the owners are the owners of the budget. It's their budget, it's their money, and they're ultimately they're the ones who determine what they want the budget to be, and uh, they get to vote on that at the AGM. But as a manager, um, I feel, I always feel quite a lot of responsibility for the budget. I feel a responsibility to get it accurate. I feel a responsibility to make sure I'm presenting a safe budget for the scheme. That's really what I want. What do I mean by safe? I want the budget to be... Um, you know, meet all the legislative requirements for the scheme over the next 12 months. I want to be able to pay all contractors. I want to make sure that the scheme remains solvent. I mean, for obvious reasons, that, that's really important. And I want to make sure that the scheme is saving enough money so that it can meet future capital expenditure without having to undertake special levies and all of the drama that goes along with those things. My goal as a manager is to present you with a safe budget. But I have to admit, you know, I have a lot of sort of fear and anxiety with, with budgets, and especially when I'm presenting to a committee uh, a budget that's quite a bit higher, because we often get quite a lot of negative reaction coming back, and people tend to blame the body corporate manager. Why are you saying this? Why do you think this or that? Uh, it's okay to have the questions, but sometimes the attitude can be quite, you know, difficult to manage on an, in, on an individual and personal level. Um, so maybe bear that in mind when you are speaking to your managers, because it's not our goal to sort of make your life worse. We're trying to help. We're trying to help guide you in with presenting what we think is a best best practice budget most of the time. And even if if that does mean your levies go up, okay, that's what it means. That's the, you know, it doesn't mean that your body corporate managers are trying to sort of just unnecessarily force you into a position that you feel uncomfortable on. Okay, um, just because we're going quite quickly, then uh, people can see here the budget's 150,000 because I've got my discount, but I'm only going to take in 135,000. But I've, I've considered all of the costs from last year. Um, I've considered things like the market, uh, I've considered things like known costs as well, because when I'm doing a budget, I might know some definite costs that are going to come up over the next three months. Um, and then I've produced this, this budget here. Uh, which comes in at a, with a 
uh, a small surplus of 5,550. And as it happens, that, bu that budget was designed to carry last year's minus figure as well. So then the administrative fund, if we'd started at zero, would just finish at $50 in credit. Um, to be honest, I'd be quite lucky if the budget worked out as exactly as I, as I, was, hoping it, I was hoping it would do here. It doesn't always happen that way, but you know, we have to come up with something. And then this is, this is the budget that gets presented. Okay. So that is the admin fund. Uh, on page two down here, we have the sinking fund. Uh, and I think most people will probably understand the differences between the administrative fund and the sinking fund. There's different ways of looking at it. Different fairly corporate managers look at it in slightly different ways. I try to explain it to people as thinking about your home budget. The administrative fund is what funds your kind of everyday expenses and expenses that you know you're going to have in advance. Um, so it might be your rent or your mortgage payments. You know you're going to have to buy food through the year. You know you're going to have to buy children's clothes and all the rest of the things that are basically kind of unavoidable. And then I tend to think of your sinking fund as your saving for major major items like your holiday or your new car. Um, it's really good if you have the money in there to pay for those things, but occasionally they get put off for another year or a year or so as well. Uh, in body corporates, it's largely the same. The admin fund is for all of your kind of regular and um, loan expenses throughout the year. And the sinking fund is designed for major capital works expenditure uh, over time. There is a lot of problems with how sinking fund budgets are organized and raised. Uh, every scheme is required to have a sinking fund report done, uh, but the, the requirement on following that report is pretty weak. Uh, you are required to repair and maintain the common property, but there's a lot of flexibility available within that. Uh, as such, many schemes, uh, if they're looking to make savings, they tend to look at the sinking fund as an area to cut back on. Um, and is that a good idea? Well, you know, it, it, does, it does ease financial pressure in the short term. But over the long term, my view is that your building is still going to have the same expenses. So you're, you're, all you are really doing is delaying the point at which you're, main, you're paying those levies in. Um, this particular building here, there's not very much to comment on. You know, we raised uh, 30,000 was raised to the sinking fund the previous year. The budget for the next year is 35,000. We can see that I'm budgeting for things like painting 20,000, which is probably an expense that I already know is coming up, gardens and grounds 5,000. And then at the end of the day, the sinking fund budget usually shows a surplus because we're not just spending for one year, but we're projecting expenditure for future, you know, we're saving for future years as well. So that's what I had to say on those ones, and I'll let you fire away with any questions that were remaining, Nikki. Excellent. Thanks, Will. Um, there are quite a few here, so we'll see how Far we can. Away. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, that was that was a great session. It was very practical, uh, I think, to be able to run through it. A few people commented, or David did. I don't know if there are more people out there that he just had trouble seeing the screen. I'm not sure why for some reason, but we will be providing um, the a link to these sample budgets in the email that comes out with the recording. So if you had issues seeing it on the screen or if you weren't able to see the figures because they were too small, Small, depending on the screen that you're looking at it on, you can actually use that with the um, samples that we're sending out. You can print them out and sit down and go through it again when you watch the recording. So that should be really helpful for you. Uh, so also, okay, Peter had asked, um, how often should owners receive or have access to the financial? Should it be monthly, quarterly or annually? Well, daily you should be able to have you should have a portal where you should be able or you know instantly um most most body corporates have that information available otherwise you know it, it can slightly depend on your scheme and it can depend how involved you are um doing a monthly checks quite good i think three monthly is probably sufficient in most cases um if you only leave it annually well don't be surprised if there's the, the occasional shock or surprise <laughs> because, you know, something might have happened that you haven't really been paying attention to. So there's no there's no set. There's no set point. You should have you should be able to access your financials almost instantaneously in most cases or, you know, at the most just by asking your body corporate manager, they should be able to provide those to you within 24, 48 hours of the outside, I would say. 
Okay, thank you. And then we had a question from Ross saying, in my experience in the corporate world, oh, sorry, the corporate world, world requires progressive exception reports, like a month-to-month -month report on um, variants against the budget. Do you know if the committee, any committees follow this in Queensland um, as part of their practice and keep their owners up to date? So I guess it's, it's a similar question. And we just had a few comments from people saying, no, they don't do it. Somebody else said, yeah, they actually do that in their building. So uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I don't think it's a standard. Um, I know that there's some treasurers out there who are accountants or who may, who may be much more familiar with that type of reporting, and they might like to do that for their for their schemes, but I don't think that's a standard across most body corporate financial reporting. And if it's okay. something that you wanted, it's something that you maybe the body corporate managers could arrange it for you, but you might have to pay extra for it because it might take them extra time to, to organize. Okay, thank you. And then we had a few, we've had a couple of questions and comments come up around um, share or coming up with the budget figures, which I know you answered a question on previously, and just um, the financial information. And then the questions about, you know, we kind of feel like we're working in the dark here trying to pull figures together. And then somebody has asked, um, Philip has asked, um, are there committee, are uh, committees interested in sharing their budgets and financial information to help each other out uh, as like a benchmarking type tool? Yeah, uh, there may be. I mean, there doesn't tend to be too much uh, committee to committee discussion in my experience. I mean, maybe there's, you know, on your website, perhaps, or other forums, people might be willing to post post what their budgets are and have that kind of discussion. Uh, benchmarking, you know, body corporate managers do tend to do some benchmarking. They will have a, uh, they will, should have an, an idea of what anticipated costs are, but it is very hard because you don't have that we don't have that crystal ball. We can't absolutely project into the future what all of your costs are. So uh, I think especially new buildings suffer from that a lot because there's been no historical expenditure. There's not necessarily, you can often discover along the way um, new items that you want to add to the budget that haven't occurred to you previously. Uh, so th those new buildings, the first four or five years of the budget can be a very, very rocky time. Uh, older buildings, it does tend to be a bit more established. Okay, thank you. There's a bit of networking going on in there of people saying that they're happy to share and they'll be face to face and have a chat with other people. So that's really great to see. So hopefully something will come of that. Maybe if you're interested in doing something like that, send me an email with your contact details and I can possibly, with your uh, with your permission, share those if, if that's something that you'd like to get involved in at some point. Uh, and then David's just asked, is there a best guess on, guess on percentage increases next year for insurance premiums? I think that's a really hard question because it could depend on so many different variables. Yeah, I mean, the number we're kind of putting out there is 10 to 25 percent, but that's uh, it has to be building specific because it depends on your building. Have you had major claims over the last couple of years? Do you have any defects issues? Do you have faults that need to be undertaken? It, it's, it's really variable. Uh, have that conversation with your body corporate manager. Really, really look at the costs. And when you're budgeting, um, budget on the safe side high would be my advice if you if you if you budget if you budget too low especially with insurance that could be a big that could be a big number that can really distort your budget that you could be out and you might require a special levy or something like that so if anything i would say budget high and be happy if it comes in under that um yeah and we've had a few comments, um, David, oh, sorry, Phillips, David's just jumped in there to said 16.7% this year. I think I saw going, because the chat's moving fairly quickly, there was somebody who put in there that it was a 54% increase. And I would hazard a guess they're probably from the north of the state. So it does also depend on where you're located within the state as well, I think. Um, we've certainly received lots of feedback from people up in that far north Queensland area with horrific increases. Um, so hopefully that will improve um, to some respect uh, with some sort of intervention. So we'll see how that goes over the next few years. The percentage number is difficult as well because the percentage is, it's got a real dollar value to it. So 54% on a $2,000 insurance policy isn't actually, you know, might only be taking it up to $3,000 or, you know, my maths isn't that good to work it out, but it's not that, might not be that high a dollar figure, but a 54% on a $100,000 insurance policy it is quite a substantial amount of money, even if you've got more owners to pay that off. Uh, that's what you have to bear in mind. So I wouldn't just look at percentages, but also consider what do you, you know, what your total dollar number is. 
Okay, well, we're right on the hour now, so I think we might leave it there. And I thank everyone who has put um, comments and questions in. The chat was fantastic, and it's really great to see everyone um, talking and, and chatting amongst themselves as well as us having the discussion, a larger discussion here. Uh, we do take a um, copy of the chat down at the end of the session, so I'll pull the questions out of it if, if you asked a question and we didn't have time to get to it. We did have some questions submitted, actually, too, via email, and Will and I have discussed them quickly, but we just didn't get a chance to, to get to them today. Um, but we'll hopefully if you get a chance over the next uh, week or so possibly you'll be able to sort of get back to the people um, via us with a response to yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll send, send me through the questions I'll put some answers down and we're happy to publish them through the website and then you can go from there Excellent. All right. That's great. I'll just um, unshare your screen for a minute just while we, while we finish up. So I'd just like to say to everyone, thank you so much for joining us in the session as always. I think it was a really great session just to have a chat around these issues that everyone's dealing with, obviously, and things are changing fairly quickly as well uh, in that area because of all the pressures that people are under. Um, so thank you very much to Will for spending the time. And this was your initiative. You suggested this, this session because this is a bit of a um, um, so sort of something that you're fairly passionate about and um, I believe and sort of one of the reasons why you're attracted to body corporate management anyway. Yeah, yeah. So budgeting is an, you know, I think we, as everyone can see, we probably could have gone on for about five or six hours, <laughs> actually. But it's best that you have that conversation with your body corporate manager. You don't want to hear it from me. Um, <laughs> ha have, have the conversation about your real budget with your manager and put the time in to make it work and you can make it work. Yeah. And hopefully this um, session's given you a bit of a guideline as to what questions to ask and, and where to ask the questions and what to look into. So hopefully that, that has helped and assisted in that in that respect. So also we'd just like to say this was our last webinar for the year. So that's, um, yeah, that feels a bit strange. I won't know what to do with myself next Thursday. So uh, we just wanted to let you know that um, we actually conducted 35 webinars over the past 12 months in 2022 and 17 of those were suitable for our Queensland audience. So we had 12 of national um, sessions and we had I think there were five that were Queensland spe specific so that was great that we were able to bring that all, all the, that information to you it's quite a quite a lot of information I know some of you have been in nearly all of those 35 sessions that we've had during the year because I see your name pop up all the time so thank you for that support as well uh, we hope that you're enjoying them and we have started to lock in sessions for 2023 as Will knows because we've spoken to him as well um, and we've got some really great presenters and uh, excellent ideas is for topics really um, something you know just lots of topics that are very different to what we've covered this year and so we'll be bringing all those through to you next year so keep an eye out as always in our newsletter for details about that and yeah it's been great to spend the hour with you Will and with all of our um, uh, people that have jumped in to to view the session yeah and owners out there bring your ideas to us what do you want a session on we'll, we'll try and answer for you anytime <laughs> Definitely. There's so, so many options out there. So we're always open. So that's wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this educational session. If you gained value from the information, please like this video. You can also engage further with Look Up Strata by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by being kept informed about Strata news via our regular newsletters. Our subscribe link is listed in the description box below.